teaching. So as soon as you're ready, Katie, go ahead. Great. Uh, it's great to have everyone here. Welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, as most of you probably know, uh, the Dharma Collective is run entirely by volunteers. Um, so all of the people who make um, all of the organization happen are all student volunteers. Um, and in that way, the collective is literally created out of a spirit of dana, of joyfully giving freely what we can give. Um, and if you'd like to participate in that collective uh, experience of dana, you can. And I will put some links in the chat now. Um, and then there is one announcement uh, for you all about an upcoming event at the Collective. We have started a Tuesday night class series um, all around wise action. And so this series grew out of conversations we were having amongst ourselves uh, within the Collective about how we as meditators are meeting this moment in time. Um, there's so much in the world that requires our careful attention. And how do we balance our inner work of practice with the outer work that's so vital now? And we thought, well, let's ask. Uh, and so we've asked uh, many different teachers to come and each Tuesday night, they're going to be answering that question. How do we as meditators meet this moment? Um, so there's a link to that if that sounds um, interesting to you. I'll put it in the chat and you can uh, check that out. So thank you all for being here. And um, without further ado, let's let's get into it. Chandra, thanks. Yeah, that's great. Exciting new Tuesday night offering. Thanks, Katie. I thought it'd be nice to... Um, to also just let you know that I'm going to post uh, to the group my webpage, and you can find a bunch of events that I'm doing in the coming weeks there. On July 18th, I'm doing a Lojong two hour workshop in the morning, 10 to 12. So you'd find that there. That's the 18th of July, this coming Saturday. And then on Sunday, I'm giving a talk on the feminine principle in Vajrayana Buddhism. And that's actually to a German Sangha, so it will be translated into German. So, <laughs> But um, everybody's welcome. It's on Zoom, of course, and that's from 9 to 10.30. You'd find that there as well. And then on Sunday afternoon, July 19th, this Sunday, I'm doing another Wisdom Rising, celebrating the empowered feminine through meditations, kirtan, and stories of great women with my friend Nina Rao. That's hosted through Tibet House in New York City. It's 3 to 5 Pacific time. And again, that's there. And then there's a bunch of other online courses that are starting in August and September. And people are welcome to join those as well. I'm doing a course called Opening the Heart of Compassion, hosted by Tara Mandala. It's uh, Mahayana teachings and meditations. And then also the 21 Tara course that I started in the spring. Part 2 is starting in September. And people can join that and catch up if you're interested in learning more about the 21 aspects of, uh, of Tara, the female Buddha of compassion. And then you can also get on my newsletter there as well. So uh, that's that for July. Lots of good things happening for the next couple months. How is my sound? I um, just want to make sure that the sound is good. Okay, great. All righty. So, I wanted to start today with some inspiring quotations from some of my favorite thinkers and talk a little bit about feeding your demons and then dive into the practice itself. I'll guide it. And uh, maybe I could see a show of hands. How many people are brand new for feeding your demons tonight? Never done it. I see one. And there are a bunch of people who aren't on video, so who knows? Maybe let's see you. A couple, couple hands. Good. <laughs> okay. So a few new people, welcome. Uh, it's, uh, it's good to have new people here and of course repeats because you can always do some, some internal housekeeping is how I like to, to, to describe this work of 
Kind of turning towards things we usually avoid or ignore or t push away even and do some housekeeping, internal housekeeping. Clear the cobwebs. And this, the, the, the title called Feeding Your Demons is interesting. It captures people's attention because usually don't we want to like suffocate them or ignore them or make them go away? The idea is that that which we resist persists. So if we aren't paying attention to it or we're actively pushing it away, we're actually helping those shadow aspects of ourselves get bigger unknowingly. <laughs> it's not your intention, but it tends to happen that way. And uh, so feeding rather than fighting our so-called demons. Now, of course, we all understand that demons are not real goblins and ghouls and ghosts out there. They are the unintegrated aspects of ourselves, our so-called shadow, as uh, Jung called it. So we're bringing those aspects home tonight. And you can choose, we'll, we'll work on, I'll encourage you to choose one thing to work on tonight. Something, maybe you have a squeaky wheel. <laughs> Maybe something zapping your energy. And of course, right now, because of the epidemic, we have plenty to work with, but also the issues of racial injustice and our cultural uh, upheaval right now is bringing up a lot of stuff. And it reminds me of four or five years ago, uh, after Ferguson and the waves of, of uh, police killings of unarmed black men, that uh, we had... I, along with some of my colleagues of color, work together to bring about work around feeding your demons with issues of privilege, oppression, and racism. And so I want to invite you to bring this work of feeding your demons into anything that is with you around these issues right now. Of course, there's also fear and other things around the epidemic, so you can choose whatever you want. <laughs> it could just be something else. But I would like to nudge you in the direction of, you know, if you're white, do you have guilt or shame? Are you feeling frozen? Are you leaning into it, your work that you have to do? But are you um, feeling disillusioned or heartbroken or angry, right? These are all so-called demons that we can work with in the Feeding Your Demons uh, practice. If you're a person of color, if you are black. There are other issues that are coming up for you that are unique to your experience in, in our world and in our culture. So working with what is up for you right now is a wonderful way to bring the feeding your demons into this present moment, as Katie said. How are we meeting the moment? I like how Gavin Newsom says that. <laughs> we have to meet the moment. So how are you meeting the moment? That's what I'm going to work on tonight, because sometimes when I guide people, I can also kind of do my own kind of softer journey with it, and definitely this is what I'm interested in doing for myself tonight. So I wanted to preface that as a way to um, really bring us into the moment right now with what might be up with, uh, with you, with me, with us as a collective, because it's also possible to have cultural demons, right? Racism is a cultural demon. The epidemic is a societal, a societal or cultural demon right now, right? We're... <gasps> Everywhere you go, you've got the mask on, you go out and take a walk, and people avoid you because you might have you know, the, the virus. It's a, there's a feeling of some unseen foe, and then fear and separation, um, despair can come up around that. So tonight we really get to meet whatever these human feelings that we might be having in the face of this challenging time to meet them within our body, to feel them, and to help liberate this fe these feelings by turning towards them, feeling them on a somatic level, and then not only feeding them through our attention and our uh, compassion and our at least our openness to turning towards it is actually like a way of feeding at your attention, but then also meeting the so-called ally I know the ally has a bad rap in certain racist work right now, racist, anti-racist work right now. I just want to acknowledge that. This is just more of a general term of like, you know, somebody, a, a, an archetype within you that supports you, that's there to help you. So Rilke said that our fears are like dragons guarding our deepest treasures. 
Our fears are like dragons guarding our deepest treasures. So when we turn towards the things that feel like dragons and demons and things that we don't want, we're able to then learn from that energy, learn from that meeting, and then reveal the treasure that's hiding underneath it. That in fact that energy is somehow guarding. So that is a wonderful way to think of this practice. That turning towards it helps us unearth our treasures within us. Our wisdom, our own knowing, and our own capacity to heal. Another quotation from Rilke, Rainier R Rilke, one of my favorite poets, uh, said, he said, there is only one journey going inside yourself. There is only one journey going inside yourself. So in this moment, while we're in self-quarantine, this is very poignant. And the Feeding Your Demons practice, like meditation, like other forms of prayer and inquiry and introspection, are the inner journey. And that is really the true journey. I remember there was a, 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 an Indian guru who used to make fun of the Westerners coming over to India. He'd say, why, don't, why are you Westerners always coming, traveling here and there around the world? Why, you need to just stay home. <laughs> Just stay home and do your practice. And that's what we're doing now. There's only one journey going inside yourself. And then lastly, I'll share a quotation from Jung, who was very influential in Lama Tsultrim's work of adapting the ancient Buddhist practice of Chud from Tibet into this modern adaptation called Feeding Your Demons. And so Carl Jung said, we will become our opposite if we do not learn to accommodate the opposite within us. I'll say it again. We will become our opposite if we do not learn to accommodate the opposite within us. So this practice, just like many other meditative practices, are about learning to meet and accommodate and befriend, learn from our opposite, those aspects of ourselves we, we think we don't want or don't want to see. So the five steps of feeding your demons are, a, you could call it a meditation, but it's also like a process, like a personal process that you can do solo by yourself if you have a, um, a guided, like if you have the book or a script, I'm, go, I'm offering you guys a PDF of the script actually, uh, Katie will post that when she has a moment so that you can download it and use it for your own practice. You can actually read it and take yourself through it. Also, you can do, um, if you learn how to do it with a partner, you can do it with a partner. If you read the book, Feeding Your Demons, it, there's instructions on how to guide a partner. Of course, if you're a professional therapist, social worker, um, you know, teacher of some kind, coach, you would want to go through the certification process if you, are going, if you want to integrate it into your professional life. Don't just wing it in a professional setting. <laughs> But of course you can share with friends and family in a more casual way. So solo or partner work is very good with this. Also group work, like what I'm doing here, is where the teacher or a guide can, can guide a group. And so that's what I do with San Francisco Dharma Collective. I used to do a lot more one-on-one, -on -one, but then um, I phased out of that. I've, I uh, got too busy, actually. So. Uh, there are certified therapists, psychotherapists in the Bay Area and all around the world who have, are certified in feeding your demons and they integrate it in their work with their clients. It's a very exciting field right now. We just finished a, a small study of feeding your demons in COVID time, time of COVID, and we've had really strong findings of de a decrease in depression and anxiety, 
around uh, illness, but also the other issues that arise at this time in COVID, increase in the sense of well-being and capacity to be with difficult emotions. So those stu that those findings will be published as soon as we can. We literally just just got the data. So we've done two studies now over the last few years on feeding your demons and it's it's exciting. It's a very effective tool. So we can understand demon to be more of, more like the daemon, which in Greek and the Greek language it actually meant your spirit guide. Later, daemon, D-A-I-M-O-N, uh, or sometimes D-A-E-M-O-N, daemon, which was your spirit guide, this inner voice, this inner guide that we were all born with, later got transformed or devolved into the word demon as a synonym of the devil, as a way for the Christian church to assert its control over people. Because if the more pagan beliefs of we all have God, with, we all have a God or an inner voice of our own wisdom within us prevails, then we won't have to go to the priest or the church for salvation. So demons were made into little devils called demons and said not to be trusted. Isn't that interesting? It's like a turning away of our own instinct. It's sad. It's very tragic. So this is a rekindling of the true meaning of the word demon, which is daemon. And that is really the ally, actually. So when we meet the demon, it becomes the daemon or it becomes the ally. So any comments or questions before we transition into the actual practice? We can use the chat function. And uh, I'm happy to clarify. Don't worry if you don't know what, it, what the practice is. I will guide you through the whole thing. You're going to close your eyes and just go on the journey with me, that inner journey. So, but in terms of like what I've shared so far, any comments, questions? And also any questions around targeting what you might want to work with tonight? It can really be an emotional challenge. It can be a physical challenge. So sometimes people work with chronic illness or pain. You can actually go into the body. The first step is feeling it in your body and then moving through that. So even if you don't know the story, it doesn't matter. This isn't about the story. This is about dropping in and having a somatic experience. I see one question coming in. What is the title and author of the book? Okay, so I was talking about Feeding Your Demons. So the title is called Feeding Your Demons, and the author is Tsultram Alioni. I can write that here. It's a Tibetan name, which is often hard to... It's a Tibetan first name and an um, Italian last name. Okay, so that's the author and then the title. Very good book. It came out, I think, in 2008 and was a, a national bestseller. It's very good read, great stories. Sultra Malioni is my primary teacher. She founded Tara Mandala Retreat Center in Colorado, where I'm the assistant spiritual director and lead teacher there. And it's an international community, too. We offer a lot of wonderful opportunities to practice. Uh, somebody writes in, when you say opposite in the quote you shared, do, you th do we think of that of our shadow and or the parts of ourselves we may not wish to acknowledge? Yes, yes. Let's just use uh, racism, for example. Why not? <laughs> so if I, if I don't want to look at my opposite, which I would say is I'm not racist, but actually because I'm white and I have unearned privilege because of the color of my skin, and even though I think I'm not a racist person, I may say or uh, perpetuate certain racist ideas or behaviors. But if I can't look at that, then that becomes a bigger shadow, a bigger opposite. And I might even become it because of my stubborn, fragile fear of, of not being able to look at that. But if I can look at it and say, what, who are you? Why are you here? 
and even just humbly bow to it and say, I see you. I know I'm not perfect here. What do I, what can I learn from you and how can I heal? Then I'm less, I, I won't become it because I will know it. It won't, I won't become my opposite because I can befriend that and then integrate it. Mm, yeah, I'm sure there are many examples of that. Uh, what about working with a nightmare related to a long past dissolute lifestyle? <laughs> wow, it, like a literal nightmare? Because you can work with dream figures. You can actually work with dream figures. So say if you have a recurring nightmare or one nightmare that is really powerful and troubling, you can actually work with the feeling that you had in the dream. And then work, work that feeling in the five steps. So that might be a, a powerful way to work with that feeling that you have that comes up in the nightmare that's related to the long past dissolute lifestyle. So I'll just guess. So maybe maybe in the in the nightmare you experience a strong sense of guilt for having lived a life that you don't feel proud of now. So then in a feeding your demon session like tonight, when I tell you now feel into what you'd like to work with tonight and feel where it lives in your body, you could feel where that guilt lives in your body and then follow through with the five steps with that. Does that make sense? But also even if it's not a nightmare and it's just a feeling of um, you know uh, revulsion or shame around past lifestyle, past things that we've done, feel where that lives in your body whether it's revulsion or shame or I'm just throwing ideas out there I don't know what you're feeling but really land on what that feeling is and then where it lives in the body and then you can work with it that way. If I have a conflict with a person, would the conflict be the demon? Good, I'm so glad you asked that question. So the demon is not the person, it's the feeling that you have within that dynamic with the person. So it's also not the conflict. So we're also, we're always coming back to the feeling. So what does that conflict with that person make you feel like? Oh, it's anger. Okay, so where does that anger live in your body? And then you move through the five steps. Some people say, oh, I'm fighting with my husband. He's, he's my demon. No, the husband's not the demon. It's the way you feel <laughs> towards the partner. Uh, that is the demon that you work with. It's like you're taking responsibility for your role in this. You're not projecting the blame out there. Sometimes my husband and I would be verging on getting in a fight and going at it like partners know how to do. And when, when I was in this training of learning how to do the Feeding Your Demons practice, I had shared it with him. He was doing it a little bit. I'd, I'd have the wherewithal to say, hey, wait, let's pause. Let's go separate and feed our own demons around the feeling that's coming up right now and then let's come back and try to have this conversation and it was revelatory it totally diffused the that sticky complicated feeling that was between us and we were able to actually talk and be productive and not argue Um, someone, yeah, okay, uh, in terms of the nightmare, I was terrified by thinking I was blind, stumbling and drunk. Right, right, so feel that terror in you, or the feeling of being blind, stumbling and drunk. Yeah, it could be all of that. And then feel where that is in your body, is it mainly in the eyes? Or the head? Try it. See how, how that works. I'd like to hear So again, with the Feeding Your Demons, you, you land on what's eating at your energy, what's blocking your experience of freedom. That's a classic definition of what a demon is in terms of this practice. What is blocking you? Is it the critic? Is it self-doubt? Is it procrastination or lethargy? 
Have you recently been heartbroken? All of that. Did you, did you throw your back out? Usually that's tied into some psychological baggage. <laughs> so it can be mental, emotional, or physical. It can be thought patterns that are eating up, you know, your chi, blocking your experience of freedom. It can be emotions that are, that kind of have you by the jugular or that don't let you settle. Or it can be a physical ailment. I've worked with clients with cancer, AIDS, chronic illness. Okay, that feels like we're ready. So let's shift. So what I'm going to ask you to do is take a little moment to make sure you're comfortable and in this time arrange an empty seat in front of you. So I would like everybody to be uh, have their face um, in profile to the camera of the computer and then have an empty seat or cushion in front of you because we'll switch positions a couple times. So everybody needs an empty seat. If you don't have a cushion, you could actually just get up out of your seat, stand and turn to face your original seat because it's a dial it's like dialogue therapy here. We're doing like um, it's not we're not doing therapy really, but we're doing um, like it's similar to the gestalt empty seat technique. So you want an empty seat. And then uh, settle in. Take another 30 seconds or so to make sure you're comfortable. Make sure there's a nice empty space in front of you and that you can uh, switch easily to that seat without needing to open your eyes. So if you have to clear anything, a glass of water or tea, make sure it's not going to get knocked over. And then allow your eyes to close. And start to take some deep breaths. And releasing tension with the out breath. We always begin with what's called the nine purification, nine uh, relaxation breaths. And so for the first few breaths now, these deep, nice, relaxing breaths, breathe into any physical tension you may be holding in your body. Feel where you hold physical tension in your body and release with the out breath. Soften. Feel that tension melting down, down into the earth beneath you. And then with your next few breaths, breathe into any emotional tension, any worries or concerns. Feel where you hold emotional tension in your body. And then release with the out breath. And then with your next few breaths, breathe into any mental tension. Any thoughts, worries, breathe in and feel where you may hold mental tension in your body and breathe out, releasing with the out breath. And now take a moment to arouse a heartfelt motivation for your journey tonight. 
be a benefit for yourself and for all beings. Now we'll take a few minutes to feel into what you'd like to work with tonight. What would you like to turn towards? What have you been ignoring? What dragons have been guarding your deepest treasures? And then feel what is most up for you now. Is it an old issue or feeling or something that just happened, just got triggered? Really taking some time here to feel into what you'd like to work with tonight. If you have a few options, just land on what feels most tender, most close to the surface right now. And when you've landed on what you'd like to work with and feel where does it live most strongly in your body? And what is its shape? What is the shape of the feeling? And what is the color of the feeling? And what is the texture? What is the temperature of the feeling? Is it cold or hot or warm, neutral? And 
And now, just for a moment, intensify this feeling, perhaps remembering what it felt like the last time you felt it strongly. And now allow this feeling, texture, shape, and so on, to move out of your body and become personified in front of you as a being with limbs, a face, eyes, and so on. If you wish, you can make a gesture with your hands, moving this energy out of the body and let it become personified as a being in front of you. And notice what you see. If an inanimate object appears, then imagine what it would look like if it were completely personified as a being, because we're going to dialogue with it. So if a rock appears, what would this look like if it had eyes and limbs? And notice, what is the size? What is its color, colors? And what is the surface of its body like? And what is its density? Does it have a gender? And what is its character like? What is its emotional state? What is the look in its eyes? And now notice something about it that you didn't see before. And 
And now I'll guide you through asking the demon some questions. You can say them out loud one after the other, not waiting for the answer because we'll switch positions and then answer as the demon. So saying out loud, what do you want? What do you really need? And how will you feel when you get what you really need? And then, having said those three questions out loud, now switch places, keeping your eyes closed as much as possible, staying in your experience. And now, facing your original seat, eyes closed, take a moment to settle into the demon's body and feel what it's like to be the demon now. If you wish, you can take a gesture, an expression, or a stance to help you embody the demon's energy. And how does it feel to be in the demon's body? And notice how your normal self looks from the demon's point of view. And now you will answer the questions and speak as the demon. I will say the beginning of each answer, and then you repeat the beginning and complete the answer. You can speak out loud if you feel free to do that, or you can do this internally if you have other people in the room. Speaking as the demon now, don't hold back. Really let yourself feel that you are the demon here, and you're speaking as the demon. What I want is, what I want is. What I really need is, this is the need beneath the want, the deeper need. What I really need is. When I get what I really need, I will feel. When I get what I really need, I will feel. Really landing on the feeling that you as the demon would have when you got what you really needed, when you got your need met. What is that feeling?
And when you're ready, when you've answered the three questions, now you can return to your original seat, keeping your eyes closed as much as possible. And settle into your own body again. Eyes are closed, and your mind's eye seeing, sensing, feeling the demon in front of you once again. And now this is where we feed the demon. So you have two options. The first is to either this is a more traditional way where you imagine that your body dissolves into nectar and that nectar has the quality of the feeling the demon would have when it got what it really needed, the answer to that third question. Or if you don't want to dissolve your body, if you dissociate or this particular issue causes you to disassociate, then just simply imagine that you create an infinite supply of nectar in any way that comes to your imagination. It might be rain, it might be snow, it might be ice cream, it might be light from the heart, anything. Just imagine that this nectar in either form has the quality, the flavor, the texture of that feeling that the demon said it would have when it got what it really needed. And feed that nectar to the demon until complete satisfaction is reached. And notice how the steamen takes the nectar in. And notice what happens as it consumes, as it receives the nectar. Does it shape shift? Does it change? Take your time here. Feel that flow of the nectar flowing from you to the demon until complete satisfaction is reached. If you sense resistance to feeding the nectar, just acknowledge that the resistance hasn't worked thus far. That's why the demon is still there. Try something new by offering that deep, deep need, that deep feeling of fulfillment, of love, whatever that feeling was. And offer that with a compassionate heart, this unending supply of nectar, unlimited nectar flowing from you to the demon until complete satisfaction is reached.
And notice what you see now. Has the demon dissolved altogether, changed or disappeared? Feeding until complete satisfaction is reached. And so now, if the demon isn't completely satisfied, that's okay. We'll do a little subjunctive mind trick so that we can continue to move through the process as a group. It can be helpful to simply imagine what would it look like if it were completely satisfied. Sometimes demons take rep more feedings or longer or some repeated processes. Sometimes they get satisfied very quickly. If your demon seems insatiable, imagine what it would look like if it were completely satisfied. And now notice what remains. Has it disappeared or has another being emerged? Here is where we meet the ally. If the demon disappeared, then invite an ally to appear now before you. If the demon transformed, ask, are you my ally? If not, that's fine. Just invite an ally to appear now before you. Inviting an ally to appear in the space in front of you now and notice what you see. And notice its size. It's colors. What is the surface of its body like? What is its density? And does it have a gender? What is its character like?
What is its emotional state? And what is the look in its eyes? And now notice something about it that you didn't see before. Now you're going to ask the allies some questions, repeating the questions out loud one by one after me. How will you help me? How will you protect me? What pledge do you make to me? And how can I access you? And then now switch places, keeping your eyes closed as much as possible. And take a moment to settle into the ally's body. Now you get to become the ally. Take a gesture, a stance, a position that helps you embody the energy of the ally. And notice how does it feel to be in the ally's body? And how does your normal self look from the ally's point of view? Really allowing yourself to be the ally. Don't hold back here. How does it feel? And now, speaking as the ally, you'll answer those questions. I'll say the beginning of each answer, and then you repeat the beginning, and then complete the answer. So a full sentence, it helps to embody it. Speaking as the ally, I will help you by. I will protect you by
I pledge I will. You can gain access to me by And now return to your original seat. For the last time now. And take a moment to settle back into your own body. And see the ally in your mind's eye again in front of you. Settling back into your original seat, your normal self, and then see the ally in front of you once again. And look into the ally's eyes and feel its energy pouring into your body. And as you feel the energy of the ally coming into your body, it spreads all the way down to the soles of your feet, to your fingertips, and throughout your whole body. And imagine now that the ally dissolves into light. Notice the color of this light. And feel this light dissolving into you, integrating this luminosity into every cell of your body. And notice the feeling of this integrated energy in your body. And now you, with the integrated energy of the ally, dissolve into open, spacious awareness. Rest in that open space. Rest in the state that is present after the dissolution. Simply resting in awareness, free of grasping, free of distraction. Rest in the simple, present, luminous awareness, free of coming and going, free of center and periphery. Allow yourself to rest nothing to do. It's just being here in the moment. If you notice thought pulling you away, just naturally liberate it with a gentle touch of awareness, thought, and then come back to this open, resting awareness.
this open simplicity is your natural state. Feel it like you're falling back in a giant feather bed. Total release, comfort, ease. Releasing tension with the out breath. Can you stabilize within this vast space? Drawing on your tools of mindfulness and introspection from time to time. If the mind is wandering or growing dull, then brighten the attention. If you are lost in thought or distracted, release and soften. And come back to this resting in the present moment in this vast sky-like nature of mind. Resting in awareness, the simple presence that pervades all of your experience. Release into that ocean of awareness.
And you fully take in the nourishment in this state. It's a natural purification. Allowing yourself to rest unfettered, unbound by the comings and goings of the churning mind, the vikalpa, the thoughts that come and go. Give yourself a rest for these last couple moments now. Just unravel all of that and rest in the present moment, fully in the body, in the moment. And feel your being pervaded by space. We are almost all space, 99.999%. Feel that. And now we'll gradually come back, come back into your body and recall the feeling of the energy of the ally in your body again. Feeling that integrated energy of the ally living within you, that is you, your inner wisdom. Feel that take root within the marrow of your bones. And then now as you open your eyes, maintain that feeling of the integrated energy of the ally within you. And notice the shapes, the colors, the light and coming back into the room. You, if you'd like, you can stretch. Maybe we were sitting for a little while there. Yes, and you can, you know, simple movements like raising your arms overhead are actually really important. Doesn't that feel good? There's all sorts of studies of movement, you know, normal movement that we used to do a lot more, like if we were building a thatched roof or a moving things around the farm, you know, those are important movements for the body, and we don't do that as much anymore, usually, if we live in the city. Definitely a few times a day, raise your arms over your head. Take a big breath. How do you feel? You feel that energy of the ally in you? Or are you like, oh, that's me. I'm my ally. <laughs> I'm on my side. <laughs> So, um, let's see, I don't know, thank you. Okay, Ted said that was profound. Good. Yes. Feel free to type in things in the chat. I think with our last 10 minutes, I don't know, Katie, what do you think chat is best or? I think we could open it up. It's not a huge group. Uh, we just be mindful of the time, right? You know, if you have a comment, share it in an essence form, not a long-winded form. If you have a question, get right to the question. <laughs> you know, we know, you know. Okay, Deborah, that was pow. Oh my God, that was powerful. Thank you. Yes. Good. 
You can do this practice daily, yes, Tanya, you can. Really, I mean, what I always say, what Lama Tsultrim says too, who created this practice, she says, do it as needed. It's not like something you have to do every day. If you feel it's needed, do it. Now, having said that, sometimes if we land on a really juicy demon, it can be good to make a commitment to working with it every day for a month. And you see the arc of it. It's not always the same. The feeling might be like, say, for example, you're trying to quit cigarette smoking. So you could be like, I'm going to feed that cigarette demon every day for a month, see what happens. Each time you come to a, the same demon, in this case, cigarette smoke, King, feel it in your body and then move through the five steps. Don't assume it's going to look the same, feel the same. Come to it with a fresh, open mind. Thank, Thank you. you for this. I felt connection and my small fearful self got held in comfort and connection to my true ally. Avalokiteshvara, beautiful. Yes, the Buddha of compassion, what an ally. Yeah, sometimes our allies can be these Buddhas, these angels or archetypes. Sometimes they can be like an animal totem. So sometimes when we meet a special ally that's very powerful for us, it's nice to find or draw or make a picture of it and put it on your shrine or someplace in your house that you'll see often to remind you of the messages and the teachings they gave you. I believe I understand now that the demon is in is the different conflicts of emotions we have around the person, situation, physical, mental. Yes, that's right, exactly. Powerful. My ally became the lotus. Wow, interesting. Good, the lotus. Powerful. Were you able to dialogue with it and become it? It was okay that it was an inanimate object? Sometimes it works, you know. The general rule of thumb is like, okay, if an inanimate object appears, then what would it look like if it were? a being. So sometimes like the lotus could bloom into a lotus goddess. <laughs> um, and then you can talk with that. But sometimes it's not a big deal. You can dialogue with a sunflower. Or... It worked. Yeah, see? The, 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 psyche, the psyche communicates in imagery. That's why this practice is so powerful. And it's okay if you don't see it in technicolor. Not many people do. It can also be more of a felt sense that you work with sometimes. Sometimes it's very vivid. Other times it's a little amorphous. And that's okay too, as long as you're connecting with the feeling and the spirit of what it is you're working with. Ah, oh, somebody also had a rose and the rose smell. That's right. Sometimes you can smell things or hear sounds. And also you can notice the environment that the demon and the ally are in. That can be an interesting popping into more multi-dimensional experience of the work, actually. What do you smell? What do you hear? What environment is it in? Those are questions that could be asked as well. My ally was an orangutan monkey, furry, warm, and orange. Yes! See? The allies can be anything, really. Surprising. Heidi, yeah. Okay, does somebody want to say something? I thought somebody was raising their hand. You can unmute. If anybody wants to unmute and just say something, that's fine too, or ask a question. Oh, I'm seeing new chats also. I see a long chat. Good, yeah. How was it working with the dream feeling? Mm. You know, it's also fun to do art with this. So if you like to draw or sculpt or paint or knit or sew, you can make or draw the ally and the demon. And what we do sometimes is we integrate the art with the actual five steps. So once you'd see the demon, right, you notice its color, its size, its texture, all of that, then you can pause and spend some time making art. 
And the art is an extension of the therapeutic aspect of this. It's not about creating a perfect representation of the image in your mind, because it's never, unless you're a great artist, that just won't happen. So it's more about the movement of the hands, about the process of making art that is an extension of the therapeutic work around this. I used to do a lot of art with this. Uh, very powerful. I did a, a course with an art teacher, a friend of mine. We called it Creative Liberation, and we did, in her art studio, we'd, we'd, in her living room, we'd do the five steps of feeding your demons, and then we'd go out to her art studio and uh, in the backyard and, and spend a couple hours making art, and we created some really great stuff. We'd do clay, sculpture, chalk, oil pastels. So if you're an artist, try. Even if you're not an artist, Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Anyone else? I commend you for your courage and for your, your deep work tonight. May it bring many healing uh, blessings for you. And I believe I'll see you next week with Eve. I think it's Eve and I both t next week. We'll continue with the book study group. Everybody's welcome to drop into that as well. Every Wednesday night, 7.30, we're here, either Eve or I. And I uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, San Francisco Dharma Collective. Woohoo! Thank you, Chandra. Yeah. You can unmute if you want. Say goodbye. Thank you, Chandra. Thank you, Katie. What book are we on? Somebody asked. We're on um, Sokni Rinpoche's Open Heart, Open Mind. Open Heart, Open Mind. I'll, I can write it here. It's a very good classic Dharma book. And I think we're on chapter uh, 12 or 13. 12. Oh, there it goes. Thank you. Uh, somebody asked, uh, Deborah, are you still on the call? Yeah. Sorry, I didn't see it. Um, do we evoke the same daemon and the same ally in our practice? Don't even assume that they'll be the same. Like, are you asking about, like, if you repeat? Yeah, you could. Basically, what you do is if work with the same issue if you're repeating, right? So if you want to repeat something, say it's, I don't know, let's throw some. Katie, what's, what's a demon? I'm tired of my old examples. Anger. Anger. Yeah, that's my favorite. Okay, so say you want to work with your anger demon. It, one day it might look like a gargoyle demon and an angel ally, but the next day it might look like a scared puppy and a Avalokiteshvara <laughs> ally. So don't assume that the imagery is going to look the same. When in doubt, if you ask questions like that to yourself, just hear my voice say, don't assume. Don't assume anything. Come fresh. Because as soon as you, you're thinking it needs to be like it was last time or it should be the same demon, that, then you're, you're killing the natural life of the process. So let it come alive. Let it be free. It might be the same. It might not. Imagery-wise, message-wise. The main thing is to come back to that same theme, anger. Claro? All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. See you next time.